the title of our study is Some Better Thing for Us. And uh, this title comes from a verse that we're going to look at in a few minutes. But before we go to the verse, I want to ask you, where in the Bible do we find the chapter that has the honor roll, the Hall of Fame of the Faithful? Hebrews 11, thank you. Hebrews 11 is a very favorite chapter to a lot of people. I know people who even, uh, you know, memorize the chapter. Uh, I like to read through it myself, and I have many times, as I'm sure you have. Uh, maybe your, Bible, uh, your favorite Bible character is mentioned in Hebrews 11. We're going to look at Hebrews 11 today. Uh, but Hebrews 11 has a very interesting or puzzling verse at the very end of the chapter and uh, before we read it I just want us to keep in mind and uh, through our study today hopefully what we'll find what we think Hebrews 11 is about is not really what Hebrews 11 is about <laughs> and uh, we will see that hopefully I just want us to keep that in mind uh, uh, Paul was doing something very specific in listing all these people, going to great length and great detail in, in stating almost the obvious about you know Noah and Enoch and Abraham and Moses, all the different names there. And uh, it wasn't just to encourage us to try and to be like them. Many times this is how we read that chapter. It's like, look at all the faithful people of all the ages. Come on, guys. Uh, so I just want us to keep that thought in mind because... We miss his point completely when we don't understand what he is trying to do. And so we miss the impact of the chapter. So this is a brief summary of, of what we want to look at. So that last verse, or verse two verses, the last two verses in the chapter, verse 39 and 40, is where we want to uh, explore this together. It says here, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. These heroes of faith, after going through this long, almost exhaustive list, and you can tell he, he kind of, he wanted to say more. You know, earlier he says, I could list so much more. Many other names. He's, he's going through this list. And then he says, all these people, they obtained a good report through faith, but they did not receive something called the promise. That's one thing. And then verse 40 he says, God actually provided something better for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So that's what I want to explore today. What is this promise that they did not receive? Because this will help us understand what is this better thing that God prepared for us. And all of this is designed to bring about perfection or to be made perfect. Why is it that they without us cannot be made perfect? What does that actually mean? What is Paul trying to say? Because this is the conclusion of the whole chapter. That's the whole point of the chapter. He went to this great length to list all these names to make this particular point. So very important verses to understand. I'm not sure if you've ever wondered about them, uh, what they actually mean, but hopefully today we'll find out together. This better promise, oh, sorry, this better thing is prepared for us. And who... Who is he referring to when he says us? Christians. Christians, the believers. Those himself and those who are receiving this epistle and reading it and believing what is written in it. God prepared this better thing for us. So, what is this promise? That's the first thing we want to start with. What is this promise? It's called the promise. What is the promise that they did not receive? When we understand that, it will help us understand what is the better thing that God prepared for us. There is one particular promise that stands out in all the scriptures down through the ages, one overriding promise. It's the promise of all promises. It's the one that God made to Abraham that Paul comments on in Galatians 3.8. He says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. You remember when God made that promise to Abraham long ago? Paul refers to it here. He quotes it and he says that this promise was actually the gospel. 
The entire gospel message is contained in this promise. God had told Abraham, Abraham, in your seed, through your line, through your lineage, is going to come this Messiah, this Savior. And in Him, the seed is referring to Christ. In Him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. That's the succinct summary of the entire gospel message. You see, this promise that was made to Abraham was not fulfilled in the days of Abraham, was it? Abraham did not receive or see the fulfillment of this promise. He believed the promise, and because he believed it, the Bible tells us, you know, uh, uh, it was accounted to him for righteousness, but he did not really experience the realization and the fulfillment of the promise. Something to keep in mind as, as we go along, because that's what Paul is really referring to. <clears throat> Again, a little uh, later, or a little earlier, uh, in the book of Acts, we have the same thing repeated as well. Acts chapter 13, verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Paul was speaking in the synagogue one Sabbath day, and this is what he's telling them. He's telling them about this one overriding promise that they're all familiar with, that is the theme throughout the whole Old Testament scriptures. And that promise is fulfilled. God raised up to Israel a Savior, Jesus. Raised up, of course, here means born. To, to raise, uh, and the next verse we'll look at it in detail, but uh, sometimes we get confused over the words. Yeah, God told, said uh, about many times about the kings that he raised up such and such a king. So raised up is not always means raised up from the dead. Okay, so God, that's the incarnation. What, the God's promise that of your seed there will be born someone. Paul's saying that is realized Jesus has been born. Notice again, a little later in the same chapter, verses 32 and 33. He says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it's also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Very powerful passage. Paul is basically, you know, triggering in their minds what they all understand, this promise that was made to the fathers, this singular promise. He calls it the promise that was made to the fathers. You see, the promise was not just made to Abraham. It was made to Abraham and all his children, of course, and God repeated it a number of times in different ways, but it's this one overriding promise that all the faithful down through the ages believed and held on to and looked forward to. It's the promise of the coming of the seed. Amazing that that Sabbath day, there is Paul telling these Jews, listen, this promise of, that was made to all the fathers, Jesus Christ is born. He is the fulfillment of that promise. Amazing uh, you know, fulfillment he is bringing to the attention of the hearers. Verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children. And this is the key. The children receive the fulfillment of the promise that is made unto the fathers. I want you to keep that in mind because Paul is... As far as we understand, he's the same author that wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. And so, this is what he's talking about when he says, all these faithful men listed in the book of Hebrews, they all died in faith, having not received the promise. Okay, you see what point he's trying to make there. And he's telling these people, the children, us, we have received this promise. And how was it received? God raised up Jesus again, as it's written in the second psalm. Uh, by the way, when it says here, God uh, raised up Jesus again, this is the incarnation. A lot of people read that to think that this is the resurrection. He's not dealing with the resurrection in verse 33. He deals with it in verse 34. So if you have your Bibles, you'll see that in verse 34 it says, and concerning that he raised him from the dead. So this is when he's dealing with the resurrection. Incarnation, resurrection. Both make a complete package in fulfilling this promise. The birth of Christ is the hope and the promise that has been fulfilled. And so it makes sense because all these faithful people in Hebrews 11, none of them lived to see the fulfillment of the promise. That's why it says none of them received this promise. God had prepared something better for us. I want to, I want to think about that in a minute because sometimes this is misunderstood and so the point of Hebrews is missed. Uh, when we think about Abraham, God made the promise to him. When God made the promise to Abraham, 
The promise was made in the future. In that he said, in you, in, or in thy seed, shall all nations be blessed. Shall is a future tense. So I'll ask you a question. Think about it this way. Were all nations blessed according to that promise at the time when Abraham was alive? No. The answer is no. God told Abraham, I'm going to do that in the future. One day it will happen. Uh, he did not, Abraham did not experience that, but he saw it. Uh, Jesus says that, and I think this is a familiar verse as well to us. John 8, 56. Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What day was he talking about? The day of Christ. Abraham saw the day of Christ. Does anyone know when Abraham saw the day of Christ? I guess the story there uh, of the, on the picture illustrated when Abraham... Uh, was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. It's probably one of the closest experiences that we have on record where Abraham saw something of the plan of salvation where God would one day give his son. This is what Jesus was really referring to, that in this experience, Abraham got a little insight as to what God was planning to do. Although it would be a little different because no one would stop the knife when it was Christ's turn to die. That's what that whole story illustrates. And just as, uh, you know, Abraham was going to offer up his only begotten son from Sarah, his wife. And he saw that one day God would offer up his only begotten son. It's interesting, God did not tell Abraham, you know, take your friend or your most trusted advisor or your most faithful servant. He told him, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. God was teaching Abraham practically a lesson as to what God himself will have to go through. And he brought Ab Abraham to the very brink and he stopped him. But at that brink, Abraham caught a glimpse of the day of Christ. And the Bible says he saw it and was glad. Of course, the ram that was caught there, I'm not sure if that's in the picture, but anyway, we know the, the story. The ram was caught in the, in the bush, in the thicket, and he took it and he sacrificed it. That was a symbol for Christ. That's what Christ would one day do. He believed that and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Of course, down through the ages, the Israelites, the faithful people of God, treasured that story uh, as, you know, uh, symbolic. And it, pinpoint, uh, it pointed forward to what God himself would do. This is how Jesus himself put it in Matthew 13 and verse 17. He says, For verily I say unto you, speaking to his disciples, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. This verse illustrates what Christ understood to be the eager anticipation that was present in the Old Testament times among all the faithful people of God. He was telling His disciples, what you are experiencing in what you are seeing, what you are hearing is something that faithful people of old longed to experience and see. One of those faithful people was Abraham or Joseph or Daniel or Moses or, or anyone in that list in Hebrews chapter 11. That's what we're talking about. We're seeing this promise and the fulfillment. They all looked forward to that. This is the promise that they had not received Christ coming as a man and being the sacrifice, the Messiah, the fulfillment of all these prophecies. Now, this promise, I hope that's clear enough now. They did not receive this promise. God prepared something better for us that they without us should have been made perfect. Well, the verse is right here, so let's, let's look at it again just to refresh. We found out what the promise is now. The promise that they did not receive. That's the promise of the plan of salvation realized. The coming of the Messiah. They had the plan of salvation by promise. But they did not live, live to see its fulfillment. Even though they longed for it. They, they earnestly desired it. It kind of helps us, uh, hopefully, appreciate a little bit of the privilege that we have. That we so often take for granted. Living at this time. Living on this side of the cross. You see, living on this side of the cross is not identical to living before the cross. You realize that? There are differences. 
practical, relevant differences for us on a spiritual level that we really need to understand and appreciate so we can actually appropriate and make use of. And that's the point that Paul is trying to make in Hebrews chapter 11, in these verses particularly, that he sums up his, his list of the faithful with. They did not receive the promise. And not receiving this promise, this last part of the verse here, it says that they without us should not be made perfect. I want to focus on that just a little bit. And uh, what is it <coughs> about them without us not being made perfect? What do they need before they can be made perfect? Okay, uh, it's, uh, no, the verse says, They without us cannot be made perfect. For them to be made perfect, we first have to be made perfect. The us, right? You, you, you see what I'm saying? Who ate too much? <laughs> okay, I know it's after lunch. It's really challenging when I ask questions, ask thinking questions after lunch. How dare I, huh? Okay, or just looking at what the verse says. Many times we need to stop and actually think about what the verse says, okay? So, uh, and, and I'm asking questions to make sure we think. I want us to all think together. I don't want to just tell you everything. So, it says, they without us should not be made perfect or cannot be made perfect. Something needs to happen to us in order for them to be made perfect. Two things we learned from that. They were not, or they are not yet made perfect. And there's something that needs to happen to us. And this something is related to this promise or this better thing that God prepared for us. In other words, this promise or this better thing has to do with making people perfect. First the us, which then allows the rest of them. You with me? That's what Paul, that's the point that Paul is making. This promise enables perfection. What does the coming of Christ have to do with being made perfect? What, does, what is the relationship? Is there any relationship? And the answer, of course, is yes. In that book, in that epistle, he already answered that. He made that point. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, for example, verse 10. It says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. This is speaking about Christ. Christ came... As a man, and when he came as a man, he was made perfect through sufferings. Interesting verse to think about. Does that mean Christ was not perfect? He was perfect, but not as a man. This is talking about him as a man when Christ came. He, he went through the process of suffering to perfect the humanity that he had taken on or that he had incorporated into his being. He didn't just take it on. He became one. It had to go through suffering. You see, there's something about the, the reality of what we're dealing with here. Christ being, uh, or in order for Christ to become a man, he actually had to be born of a woman, just like all of us are in this room or any other human being. We are born and it's our birth that gives us our humanity. We inherit our nature from our parents. And so Christ became one of us. He was actually born. It wasn't an act or a show. He was born of a human and inherited the human nature. He is one of us. A human being, just like one of us. And it's very similar to how Christ was the begotten Son of God. Before that, He was begotten of the Father. And He inherited, therefore, the Father's nature, which made Him a divine being. The divine Son of God. That's His inheritance. So when He... He came as a man, he came and took on humanity, literally, by being born like any other human being. Well, there was a miracle there, but he was born of a woman, like we all are. And so, when we look at him as the Son of Man, we know that that's real. It's just as real as him being the Son of God. He, it's an inheritance in both aspects. He inherited the divine nature and the human nature. But now that he is a human, the Bible says he was going to be made the captain of our salvation, he was going to be perfected through suffering. Captain of our salvation, that's the image of, he is the head now. He is the last Adam. He is the head. He is now the final answer to the problem of sin that God has in this, in this human being. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 
says essentially the same thing in different words. And being made perfect, speaking of Christ, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Wow. Could Christ author salvation without being made perfect? No. So he had to go through suffering as the captain of our salvation and be made perfect to perfect this humanity that he had now adopted, that he had now inherited. And being made perfect, that now qualifies him to become the author and... Well, it doesn't say finisher there. That's in the next verse, but we'll come to that. But it says the author of eternal salvation. To write down eternal salvation. Eternal salvation was authored in the life and experience of Christ as a human being, as he was being perfected. That's what he was doing. Let me ask it to you in another way to appreciate the point maybe a little bit better. Could Christ author salvation before he came as a man in Bethlehem? So all through the Old Testament time, salvation was promised, but it was not yet authored or realized or fulfilled. You with me? This is the point Paul is making here in, the, in Hebrews. And, and remember, this is the lead up to Hebrews 11. He's making all these points before he gets to Hebrews chapter 11. Christ has been made perfect. He authored eternal salvation to all those that obey Him. <clears throat> what about us? What does Him being made perfect have to do with us? Because remember, the verse in Hebrews 11 that we're exploring is, the day without us should not be made perfect. We can see Christ now. What is the relation to us? Again, the apostle answers that in the same book a little later, chapter 10, verse 14. He says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Jesus is this one offering. Through the offering of this perfected life that he lived, it was perfected through suffering. He authored our eternal salvation because he has been made perfect. And he offered up himself through this offering now, because he is a human being like us, now that enables him to do what? To perfect those that are sanctified. That's his believers, that's his followers, that's those who accept him. In other words, our perfection finds its source and completion in Christ, in the offering of his perfect life. This is why Christ did not come to just die. Christ, you know, a lot of people focus a lot on the cross, you know, uh, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but Christ could have come on a weekend to die and rise and go back to heaven, but that's not enough. He had to live as a man. He had to experience suffering and be perfected as a man. All of that was leading up to the cross, so that when he came to the cross, he was a perfect offering as a man. That's the key point here, because he was saving men. And when he offered that one offering, it perfected forever. That's why we don't need any more offerings. It was a complete, satisfactory offering. It perfected forever all those that are sanctified. That's us now, right? That's the point Paul is making. And this is why in the next chapter, well, a couple of chapters later, Paul again emphasizes this aspect. Again, familiar verses. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, let's put that up, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Chapter 12, of course, comes straight after 11. When he says, when we have all this cloud of witnesses, we are compassed or surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. What's he talking about here? The cloud of witnesses that he just listed by name in the previous chapter. And then he's using that to urge us to, look, to do something, to look to Jesus, the author, and now he says, the finisher of our faith. So now I think we understand what the Apostle is referring to as to when Christ authored and finished our faith. You know when he did that? As a man. When he came as a man, he began, he began to author 
our faith through all the different experiences that he was going through, through all the sufferings, through all the trials. He was perfecting this humanity. When did he finish it? When he said, it is finished. So the humanity of Christ, that whole package, is where our salvation has been authored and finished. And this promise, Paul is saying, was all these faithful people, they did not receive. They died before this promise was realized. God prepared this better thing for us so that they without us should not be made perfect. And it's in this authored and finished salvation, which is really none other than the life of Christ. In that is where perfection is found for any human being. Christ is the first human being to ever be perfected. Do you realize that? No one, no one preceded him. Uh, I guess we can talk about some other details in the question time, but I want you to think about this for a minute. Enoch, Moses, and Elijah are referenced in Hebrews chapter 11. Why it's interesting is because these three individuals, unlike all the others, they actually happen to go to heaven. And I just finished, long before the cross, right? And I just finished telling you that the first human being to be perfected was who? Jesus Christ. Okay, that's something to think about. That's food for thought. Because there is a major, major difference before and after the cross. So this is, brothers and sisters, this is the better thing that God has prepared for us. A perfected human being who can and has made us perfect by offering up himself. If we are his, if we are sanctified. That's what the scripture says. That's why Paul makes this point. And maybe you're starting to see a little bit now what he's intending in Hebrews chapter 11. He's trying to get his readers to realize that despite the list of the most faithful people in the Old Testament, his readers actually have something better. Something better than Enoch had, than Moses had, than Joseph had. These are all people who are listed in that chapter. Now we can see what this something better is. I want to bring the same point from the reverse perspective because uh, Paul does it again beautifully in the same epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, you see, when, when Christ authored and finished our faith, and, and brought about this perfection in his perfect life. This perfection was impossible before Christ obtained it. It wasn't even there. It was promised to come. I want to illustrate that, like I said, in some verses. Look at uh, Hebrews 7, 19. We've mentioned this a couple of times already, but it says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The law given by Moses, as John tells us, the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That law made nothing perfect. The people who were living under the law were not made perfect. Important point to keep in mind. Paul is trying to make a contrast here between the period of the law, which is the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, and covenant and testament are interchangeable. Okay, it's the same word. It's used interchangeably in Scripture. Sometimes people get a little bit confused about that. But that's, that's what we refer to when we say Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. I know often we use Old Testament to refer to the first section in our Bible. But that covers the time period of the Old Covenant. And again, the, the last section in our Bible is the New Testament. And uh, it's talking about what the New Covenant is. So it's, it's important to just keep that in mind. The law makes nothing or made nothing perfect. That's Hebrews chapter 7. Now I want you to notice the build-up here. Very interesting chronological build-up. We'll go a couple of chapters later to chapter 9. Verse 9. Speaking about the same system. He says, Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, under the old covenant, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. It goes a little deeper here. It says, all these things in this old covenant, all these sacrifices, all these offerings, all this system could not make the believer perfect, the, the one who did the service, as pertaining to the conscience. Something on the inside was still imperfect that this system could not remedy. 
In other words, he's talking about a perfection that was not possible or available in the time of the Old Covenant. There were works. Sorry? Because there were works. There were works, yes, that's true. It was a system that was never designed to make perfect. It was designed to point forward to the promise which would make perfect, which is when Christ would alter and finish our faith. You see, the plan of salvation was still a future thing for these guys. So Paul is talking to people who were stuck on the law and he's reminding them of the shortcomings of the law. It could not make perfect. Chapter 9. Okay, chapter 10. He says it again. For the law, verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Again and again he says that. I want you to get this. I don't want you to miss this point. Chapter 7, he says it. Chapter 9, he says it. Chapter 10, he says it. He keeps saying it could not make them perfect. And in, then in chapter 11, he launches into a detailed list of the names of all those people who were not made perfect. That's his point in listing them. You with me? We usually read that chapter in the opposite way. His point is, he says, let me tell you. Let me tell you how, what, the point I'm trying to make. It couldn't make perfect. Here, look at all these examples. Enoch, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, all the faithful of all the ages. And he says, all of these, don't you realize, they died before receiving the promise? I know that's an impressive claim to make, right? Okay, and, and the reason why all these people were not made perfect in the way that Paul is referring to here is because they all lived before Christ came and authored and finished our salvation. Before he had become perfect as a man and offered up his perfect sacrifice which perfects us. He's saying they did not have that. Because God prepared this better thing for whom? For us. Wow. You seeing the point here? The whole emphasis of the chapter shifts completely as to what Paul is intending for us to understand. We now have that which makes perfect. And I want to deal here with something because I'm sure this is going to pop into your mind as it did in my mind. And someone might rightly say, well, hold on a minute, brother. You know, in the book of Job, the Bible says Job was a just and a perfect man. If you read the description there in Job chapter 1, and, and others have similar descriptions. You know, what are you talking about saying they were not made perfect? Now, Job very well qualifies to be in Hebrews chapter 11. He's not there, I know, by name, but he's one of the faithful people. There were many other faithful people who were uh, like Job. What are we talking about? You see, there's something in the scriptures that indicates to us that perfection is not what we think it is many times. There is no question that Job was perfect and others were, in however uh, circumstances they were in. But perfection is not always the same thing. There is what, what I, I like to refer to as relative perfection. We're going to explore that a little bit briefly here because this helps us understand what point Paul is trying to make in Hebrews chapter 11. There is a perfection that Christ brought about that was not there before he authored and finished it. But there are different stages and different levels of growth. Let me illustrate what I mean with some verses as we think about it. Matthew 5, verse 48. Jesus says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I think this is again a familiar verse to many of us. I want to ask you a question. Can we be perfect just like God is perfect? It really depends what you mean. All right? So I'm going to say, well, brother, you need to tell us a little bit more. You can't be perfect having perfect power, all power, right? Impossible. You can't have perfect knowledge, all knowledge or understanding, right? And yet Jesus says, be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is Perfect. So there is something here that we need to keep in mind. Jesus is not saying you need to be mini-gods. 
Sometimes people read this verse this way and implement a requirement and a standard of perfection that is utterly impossible for humans to achieve. In trying to be perfect in every way possible. What Jesus is referring to here, brothers and sisters, is what he's saying. Just as God is perfect as God, so also you need to be perfect. But we're not God. We are humans. So we are on a different level. This is what I'm talking about, relative perfection. If you look up the meaning of the word perfect there, you'll actually find that it means complete or finished or full-grown or mature. And if you look at the parallel passage in Luke, you'll find that what Jesus is referring to more specifically is the heart attitude where God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Previously, he just said, love your enemies. That's, that's part of the perfection that he's talking about. So, just as God is perfect in his fear as God in that level, Christ says you need to be perfect in your sphere on your level. You with me? Not perfect on the God level because that's not our level. Very important point to keep in mind because many times, and I find this many times especially in, in, in among people who, who focus on all the different standards that we need to come up to. And what is presented many times is a perfection that people strive to obtain that God never intended or designed. And what happens is people have this miserable Christian experience. This experience of trying and failing. And many times that's linked with trying to be perfect through what the law dictates and spells out. So this is important to also keep in mind. Let me give you another illustration. Jesus gave it. Very beautiful, fitting illustration. Mark 4, 28 and 29. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Very, very fitting illustration of Jesus here giving the progressive nature of perfection. I want you to think carefully about what he said, because it helps us understand on the bigger picture what we're talking about when it comes to Hebrews 11, and why we said that was a list of all the people who were not made perfect in the way that Paul spells out in the book of Hebrews. Now, if you put this on a chart... I want you to just keep this in mind. The four stages of development that Christ was talking about, right? They are the blade, the ear, full corn, and the complete fruit or the harvest. I want you to keep that in mind. If we were to chart all this, I really like charts. They help me understand. The cross is right there. Christ's birth is where that is. This is the resurrection. This is the day of Pentecost. Now, if we were to put these things that we have found and apply them on the full... Uh, on, the, on, the, on the timeline for all of humanity. We're looking at different stages because many times we're represented as a harvest and so on. We'll see that Jesus says there are different stages of development. I want to think about this. The blade is a perfect blade. Isn't that right? In that sphere, at that level, the best thing that it can be is a blade. If you were to expect a harvest at this level, you don't understand farming. <laughs> Correct? Now, this is very significant, brothers and sisters, because according to Jesus, perfection is relative. It is in stages. Perfect blade. Then different circumstances come about. Different things are available. Then you have an ear. Same thing. This is a perfect ear, as an ear. Full corn. This is a perfect full corn until it finally reaches the full <laughs> maturity of a harvest, then it is a perfect harvest. And the conditions and the circumstances that exist for a harvest to come about are different to what exists for the blade. For example, you know, uh, many times with some crops, you need a latter rain to bring the harvest to the point of maturity or to, to bring the crop to a point of maturity where you can then harvest it. 
you would be caring for the plant and giving it some attention and, and maybe different things along the way to make it develop to the next stage. You with me? It would be very, like I said, uh, very poor farming skills of us to expect to get a harvest while we only provide the conditions that are good for a blade. Okay, so very, very simple, I know, but Jesus is using this to illustrate something. And the reason why I laid it here on this timeline is because this is very illustrative of the entire stream of humanity and the plan of salvation. All the people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11 lived on this side of the cross, where certain conditions were available to them to reach the full level of maturity and even perfection relative to their stage. Paul is writing the epistle to the Hebrews after the cross, where we now have another stage, other things that are available to help us to reach another level of maturity and perfection that was not possible before. But it doesn't mean that this is not a perfect blade or a perfect ear. You with me? So the perfection of the crop at the, sta at the later stages is a different kind to the perfection of the crop at an earlier stage. I want us to just see that because Christ, uh, like I said, that illustration is very, very fitting. Now, uh, do I have anything else here on that chart? Oh, I have the same thing. Okay, all right, yeah. Progressive nature of growth uh, from blade all the way to harvest. Very fitting picture, and we'll see that in a number of ways, illustrated in a number of ways uh, with what Jesus also said. <coughs> What brought about the change of condition is, of course, the fulfillment of the promise. The coming of the Messiah. Uh, if, the, if the crop does not receive the promise of more rain, they never reach harvest. If the promise of the Messiah was not fulfilled, no one would be made perfect in the way that is required for God to harvest humanity. Uh, if I was to put it in, a, in another way. Remember when Jesus comes in the book of Revelation, he's coming on a cloud. What does he have in his hand? A sickle. And what does the angel tell him? It is time for you to yeah, thrust in your liquor and uh, sickle and reap, for it's time for you to reap for the harvest is come or is ripe. And what does he reap? Not grain, not fruit. He reaps people. It's talking about humanity. It's using the same language. The harvest is ripened because of what Christ has brought about. As we shall see, before that it would have been impossible. Notice what Jesus says in John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Who or what is this corn of wheat that Jesus is referring to? Himself. He is that corn of wheat. He's saying, without my death, there can be no fruit or no harvest. All the people that lived before the death of Christ, it was impossible for them to reach the level of harvest. Absolutely impossible. That's what he says here, right? He had to die. If he didn't die, he would remain alone with no one to save, no salvation for anyone. Except he died, you know, if it wasn't for his death, only because of that can he bring forth fruit. This is why Paul is saying to the people reading his epistle, don't you know that all these people who died, they did not receive the promise. Because God has provided or prepared something better for us. That something better is what Jesus is talking about here. His death. Because his death is the culmination of what he was authoring. Our salvation. <coughs> I think, yeah. okay, I think, I, think I, I, I made that clear. Let me put it in another way. Again, Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Speaking about the servants that knew or didn't know the Master's will. Jesus says, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Very significant verse as well. When you are given much, 
you are expected to give back much. And we see that also in the parable of, of the talents as well. The same principle. This is the point I want to focus on. The people who are living before the cross, these heroes who were mentioned in Hebrews 11, they were given a lot of things. But they were not given the promise yet. We are. And so what is expected of them and what is expected of us is not identical. Because we have been given much, we are expected to give more. And to come up to the next level in the growth and in the maturity, targeting or working towards a harvest. You with me? An amazing picture really starts to develop. If you really think about that and let it sink into your mind, then you realize, oh... Is that what Paul is saying in Hebrews 11? It's actually very, very amazing. So to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. I put it to you, brothers and sisters, that we have been given the most in the gift of Christ. God poured out all the gifts of heaven in his Son. All the blessings are contained in Christ. We have been given that. People who lived before that time, they longed and wished for a glimpse of that. They wish that they could see that time and experience it, as Jesus said and we read earlier. And so, this, this is not, I'm not, and I'm not saying this uh, to discourage us, it is to encourage us. That's what Paul is doing in Hebrews, particularly there in chapter 11. And so perfection is not what many times we think it is. Think about it this way. Uh, when we get to, when we get to heaven, we'll all be perfect, Right? One would hope so. We better be. Sure, we certainly will. I want to ask you a question. Do you think your love for God will increase in heaven? Will it be more perfect? Let's say after a thousand years, say a million. doesn't make that much difference. It's a long time. A million years in heaven of searching into or understanding more about God's character and, and exploring God's vast universe. Do you think that uh, our understanding will increase a little bit? And therefore, our response of love? Yep. Okay, does that mean our love when we first got there was imperfect? No. no, it grows. And so, perfection is a growing process, even in heaven, when we're all perfect and there's no more sin. It's just a little illustration as well to show that this is why God and Christ, of course, gives all these illustrations in nature and so on. He illustrated spiritual truths and realities in the world around us so that we would get it. Yes, we are a little bit thick when it comes to spiritual things. No question about it. That's why God is putting it everywhere so we would get it. Sin does that, okay? Sin numbs our perceptions. And so Christ many times has to spell it out. We all have that problem. I don't need to ask you to put your hands up. But it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that Christ is illustrating for us, brothers and sisters. It's an amazing thing. I want to give you another illustration. We'll close with that one. Uh, and again, I think this is a very clear one. In Matthew eleven thirteen, this is how Jesus puts it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What's Jesus referring to? The Old Testament scriptures. This is the totality of the Old Testament scriptures. The law and the prophets, they all had a function. They prophesied until John. What do you read here that he did not say? That from John, they are fulfilled, right? A prophecy is something that needs to be fulfilled. So the Old, Old Testament prophecies, they prophesied, their function was to prophesy until John. John stands there as a marker for the commencement of the fulfilling of these prophecies of the law and the prophets. Something would change after John. In Luke 16, 16, he spells it out a little bit more. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. The kingdom of God. You know what that means? The kingdom of God was never preached before the time of John. Correct? That's what he says in the verse. From the time of John, the law and the prophets were prophesying. We're looking forward to the, to the time when the fulfillment would come. Part of this fulfillment here, according to Christ, is this thing called the preaching of the kingdom. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's the same thing. John stands as the first preacher, the first prophet ever in the history of the Bible to preach 
that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's what he first began to do. It was the burden of the prophecies in the Old Testament to point forward to that time, but their time was not the time of the kingdom of God. That time began with John, particularly the preaching of John. So I want to illustrate that in, in our chart. We'll put that on there. Uh, John stands as the transition point or marker point. All the law and the prophets were until John, and from the time of John, the kingdom of God is preached. <coughs> what does that mean and what is that talking about? I'm not going to go to that in, in, into great detail about that, but we find this interesting verse in Revelation 12 and verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. If you remember Revelation chapter 12 is that chapter that begins with the woman standing on the moon clothed with the sun and a 12 star crown on her head. What does that symbolize? The church which gave birth to a man child who was to rule our nations with a rod of iron and that man child was caught up to God and to his throne. That is none other than Christ. In very brief verses, it gives us that picture. And then it talks about a war in heaven between Michael and his angels. So the timing of that war, according to the context, occurred when? After Christ ascended as a human being. Okay? I'm not going to go into great detail, but straight after that, this announcement takes place. Satan is kicked out of heaven, it says. And then this announcement takes place in verse 10. And this announcement mentions four very significant things. The reason why I gave you the context of the chapter, because the timing is very important. It says, now is come salvation. It means it wasn't there before that time, right? When I say now is something's come, it wasn't there before. Now is a very important marker in time. That's why I wanted to uh, go over the context to pinpoint what time this now is. It cannot be before Christ authored and finished salvation. It has to be after that, where now heaven recognizes what Christ accomplished in, in, in heaven. This announcement is made. Now is come salvation. And then what else is there? And strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. When Christ authored salvation and finished it, recognized by heaven, that ushered in the beginning of this thing called the kingdom of God. That's why when John started to preach, he said, listen, the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand means close, just around the corner, about to come about or about to you know, come to being. And so this, the timing here of it being recognized by heaven is significant and illustrates that before that time, it was not yet there. It was promised, but not yet realized. Now we come to an interesting verse. I'm sure you have puzzled about this verse, as I have. And it's this one, Luke 7, 28. Jesus speaking, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. You ever thought about this verse? Have you ever wondered, what does this verse mean? I remember, what does this verse mean? And I remember explanations of, oh, well, you know, it means that the, the least one up in heaven, we all get to heaven, you know, and uh, attempted explanations that don't really, to be honest, don't really cut it. Let's just pause here a little bit so we can appreciate the words of Christ. Would it be safe to say that according to Jesus, John the Baptist is greater than anyone named in Hebrews 11? Would you, would you be happy with, to agree with that? Yes. I think it's a, that's a high qualification. If you get this recommendation from Christ, he says, listen, among all that are born of women, there is no greater prophet, and the list of the people in Hebrews 11 is pretty much a list of prophets. Mm -hmm. There is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. So of all the faithful that lived before the cross, John the Baptist is top of the mountain. Correct? Mm -hmm. According to Jesus. Now, why is that? Before we move on to the next part of the verse, why is that? As I mentioned before, because 
of all the prophets, he had the most single honor of living to usher in the coming of the Messiah. He literally was the one who pointed out the Messiah. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was him pointing out to the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. And with this preaching, he was also privileged to preach this thing called the kingdom of God is at hand, is close. And then Jesus says these words, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does that mean? That's the puzzling part of the verse, right? Because that means there is some other thing, some other place, some other situation where the least person in that thing called the kingdom of God actually is considered greater than the greatest prophet of all the Old Testament. What Jesus was talking about here in the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters, is none other than that kingdom that he came to establish among his believers when he became a man. It wasn't only John the Baptist who preached that the kingdom was at hand. Jesus preached it. When he began to preach, he says, repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. When he told his disciples to go and preach to the villages and all the different places, he told them the same thing. Go and preach and tell them that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. There was something that was coming that the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples was urgent in proclaiming this thing called the kingdom of God. We're going to look at what that means in a little bit as well. But I want us to look at it in the chart. What we're talking about basically, uh, let me illustrate it, that'll be, that'll be better. Here is John the Baptist. He's the top according to Christ. He's the greatest of all the prophets. And then Jesus talks about this thing called the kingdom of God. And the least one in the kingdom of God is actually greater than John the Baptist. So I want to ask you a question. Was John the Baptist in the kingdom of God, according to what Jesus says? No. You know why? He died before he could see it established. He died just before it was established. Because the kingdom of God was established after Christ rose as a man, went to heaven, and then we hear this announcement in heaven that says, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. It was sometime after the resurrection of Christ, when He went to heaven, that we have this announcement that now the kingdom is here. And Jesus is saying, you know what? The least person who is in this kingdom, who experiences this thing called the kingdom of God, is higher or greater than... John the Baptist. What he was saying was basically, we are transitioning to another stage in this crop. To a stage where the least corn is greater than the ear. You with me? You see the point here? This is what Christ was saying. So what ushered in the kingdom of God? Well, I guess it's pretty, it's put there on the, on the, on the chart. But let's, let's look at what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 2 and verse, well, yeah, that's, that's what the new covenant is all about. We're going to come, come back to that in a minute, but I want to read Acts 2 and verse 39 first. Notice what it says here. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is the promise that was made to the fathers that is now realized. And the promise is has to do with the reception of the Spirit or the life of the Son. Peter is saying, this is now yours. This happened on none other than the day of Pentecost. You see, on the day of Pentecost, you see a very clear picture in a, sorry, an illustration of the power of Christ in operation. Because the announcement in heaven said, now has come salvation and strength or power. And the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. The power of Christ was seen in a very visible manifest token on the day of Pentecost, which ushered in the public inauguration of this thing called the kingdom of God. Ever since that time, brothers and sisters, we have been living in the time of the kingdom of God. Many times we misunderstand the words of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, he taught them when they pray, they say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what? 
Thy kingdom come. We all pray that, I think. And when we pray, Thy kingdom come, what do we think of? Second coming? Mm -hmm. Heaven? Yeah. Right? Would I be fair in thinking that that's what most people think? Yeah. When Jesus told His disciples that, the kingdom that He was talking about was not yet established, but it was established on the day of Pentecost. Because they went around preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And he actually told them, when you pray, pray, your kingdom come. Because before that kingdom could come, he had to go through a severe trial of meeting Satan and taking on sin, which could go either way, right? And so he said, pray that the kingdom of God would come, thy kingdom come. So our understanding of the kingdom of God, many times we're looking at the physical uh, you know, visible aspect of the kingdom, and we miss what Christ accomplished on earth. When Christ came on earth, He established a very real kingdom, brothers and sisters. A kingdom where He rules. Because at that time, for the first time in the history of the universe, Satan was finally defeated. And that's the evidence that is given in that verse we read earlier in Revelation. It says, the king now has come salvation and strength from the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The evidence that this kingdom is established is the casting out of Satan from heaven as the accuser of the brethren. That happened when Christ became the new representative for humanity as our high priest. With Christ becoming our high priest as a man for the first time, he had the right to cast out Satan who had usurped the position of representing man from Adam. And he held that position for 4,000 years. And his work up there in heaven was to accuse the brethren day and night. You see it in the story of Job and a few other instances. That position Satan was dethroned from when Christ went back as a man and took back the right of representing humanity, now we have a human to represent us for the first time since the fall of Adam. And in so doing, he established this kingdom of God. On this, in a spiritual sense. It's not something you can see and feel. I'm going to look at the verses that deal with that as well. But I just don't want us to miss the, the transition that happened in heaven and therefore on earth before and after the cross. He began His work for the first time as our High Priest. Could Christ be our High Priest before that time? No, no. no for a number of reasons. I'm not going to ask you why. I'll just tell you. For a few of them. He was not yet a human being. He needed to be a human being to minister for man. Salvation was not yet authored and finished. Sin was not yet defeated. Satan was not yet crushed or defeated. So all these things needed to happen in order for Christ to become a faithful and sympathetic high priest so that he can succor us and help us because he was also tempted like we are and overcame. So there's a lot that happened as a result of what Christ accomplished. And this is why Jesus says, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist who was greater than all the prophets born of women. And this is why because we have been given so much, there is much that is required of us. Luke 17, 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you or among you. This is the kingdom that Jesus was referring to. This is the kingdom that John the Baptist was preaching about. When did this kingdom take root within? When Jesus told his disciples, wait until you receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. With the descent of the Holy Spirit, which we've been talking about this weekend, is none other than who? Jesus, Jesus Christ himself, not physically in the flesh. It's Christ occupying the kingdom within. This is where the kingdom commences. This is where the kingdom begins. He sets up his rulership in our hearts. This is called the kingdom of God. In a way that was not possible before because now he is a human being. He can do that in a way much more intimately 
than before he was a human. He can do it in a way where sin can be utterly expelled in a way out of the heart that wasn't possible before he defeated sin and Satan. You see the difference? And so he's basically telling us, listen, John the Baptist died before that time. John the Baptist did not live to see the day of Pentecost, the glory that happened on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus says, listen, the least one that gets to experience that, the least one that gets to be in that kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Amazing to really think about that and to ponder it. And this is why, brothers and sisters, that beautiful verse that we all know, it's a scripture song as well. You all know it. But seek ye first what? The kingdom of God. What do we usually think that's referring to? Heaven or second coming. You know, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, seek first and foremost. Make it your priority in your life to get into this kingdom that I came to establish and set up. This kingdom where I sit and rule in your heart in a way that puts you, if you are even the least one in it, that puts you above John the Baptist. Seek that kingdom with all your heart. And then all these things will be added unto you. Amazing how much God has made, done for us. And yet we miss some of these things, right? And this is what Paul is trying to do in Hebrews chapter 11. He's trying to remind us of that. And so, uh, the list of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11 is something that is not just to encourage us to be faithful like them. Paul's point is actually far from that. What? Maybe I'll ask it this way. Would, would you like it if your name was in Hebrews chapter 11? I'm sure you would, right? Everybody would. To be among those in, listed there. You know, some of the greats to be listed to them. The point of Hebrews chapter 11 is simply this. We have more than them. We not only need to come up to their level. We need to bypass them. You realize that? We need to bypass them because they without us cannot be made perfect. We need to get to that which Christ came and accomplished. That perfection which he perfected forever. Those who are sanctified by the offering of himself. We need to get to that place so that we can all reach the harvest stage. And we can all be gathered. This is the point that he is trying to make. So next time you read Hebrews chapter 11... Keep in mind that the end and the conclusion and the whole point of it is very different to what many times we think it is. I'll close with this verse in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul writing and he says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is what the kingdom of God is about. It's about receiving the promise of the Spirit. That promise of the Spirit is the blessing that God promised to Abraham, Abraham when he said, In your seed shall all nations be blessed. That's the gospel promise. The gospel is none other than the restoration of the kingdom of God among men, among mankind, among humanity. That kingdom of God is not an external kingdom like the kingdoms of this world. God's kingdom is first and foremost established within He's restoring man completely from within. Christ came to accomplish that. That's what the work of the Spirit and the promise of the Spirit is all about. And I just pray, uh, brothers and sisters, that we can truly realize what we have in Christ. We have been given so much. Maybe we don't realize it. Maybe we don't fully appreciate it. Maybe we don't fully understand it. And when we realize and understand it, then we can realize what we can achieve, what we can achieve through Christ, what we can be because of what He has done and what He has accomplished. So I want to challenge you with this, and I know it's a big challenge. You know, we started with Hebrews 11. I don't, I don't think I need to ask you, you know, most of us, we look up to these people, right, listed there. You know, here's this, uh, here are these brothers coming from Australia telling you, oh, no, 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 you don't need to just come up to their level. We're going past their level. And I think, brother, what are you talking about? We're not even there. We're not an anywhere near these people, right? If we were to be honest. But uh, like I said, this is not to discourage us. We just need to look to Christ. This is not about try harder. 
brother or sister, come on, work a little hard. This is not what this is about. It's about looking to Christ more clearly and seeing Him for who He really is. It's a call to come closer to Christ and to be more full of this promise, that we might receive this promise of the Spirit. It is through faith. It's not through trying harder, okay? It's not through attempting to keep the law better. It is through faith. This is why it's called righteousness by faith. I'll leave it at that. I pray that uh, you will take that to heart. I invite you to join me as we close in a word of prayer.